remembrance of my father in the New York Times, which has been a remarkable, you know, a just outpouring of love and connection and all. So, so that's my hermit time, right? <laughs> Actually, illumination from the beyond and illumination in that. Well, I've been, I keep telling people I've been in and out of the astral realms, right? It's just. <laughs> Get your URL pass. Your yeah. astral, your astral. My past. astral, my astral <laughs> past, yeah. <laughs> okay, we got four people aboard here and we're good, okay. to, we're, we're rocking. Find my book. And, uh, you know, the, the sessions that we have been doing here and the sessions that we, that Jordan and I have been doing mm. on Sunday morning have been getting something like 270 um, hits in the first 24 hours, typically, wow. um, which is, you know, to me is a lot because my way of thinking about it is that everything we say gets amplified 10 times somehow, you know, it, it somehow it, uh, you know, people repeat something they heard or so, some such as that. Um, Jordan's, uh, Jordan's story about the four-year-old birthday party was uh, particularly <laughs> popular. <laughs> That's, yeah, that, In the it's so short. I'll, I'll share it here. It's um, sure. the, um, when I'm talking to people about making sure they, if there's not the heart of the matter in their actions, don't do them. What's mm -hmm. the point? But that sounds cool. What's the point? Okay, yeah, I get it. But then I, the example I give is take a four-year-old and he walks into a birthday party and there is no birthday cake. And the four-year-old indignantly goes, what's the point? And then the <laughs> judge walks right into the room, nails down the gavel and says, case dismissed. No one's arguing with that. So That's right. <laughs> Right. Except I had it being a four-year-old girl. I was a four-year-old girl. So four-year-old four girl. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, um, that may be better because someone would listen to it. Yeah, it was cuter. <laughs> yeah, it's cute. Well, the little girl is indignant. The little boy is throwing a tantrum. I mean, look at the sexism that early. The little girl probably right. got a point. The little boy's just complaining. <laughs> Okay, well, I will uh, start the reading tonight. Um, it's a one-page paragraph, so we'll have to figure out what the essence of this paragraph is. We'll, we'll ask, what's the point at the end? <laughs> yeah, what's the point? <laughs> Where's the birthday cake in the paragraph? Yeah, well, and the, and the point is that, that Young wrote very long paragraphs, because he wanted to get a whole idea into one paragraph. He did mm -hmm. it like, like a, a fruitcake or something. And uh, at least so, so said Edinger. So anyway, I will read it. Soliloquy of the idea. Paragraph, it, paragraph. And, and we will hear from Nick on what he thinks, because this is one of his favorite people, I think, that we're talking about tonight. So... Okay, chapter, or I'm sorry, paragraph 111 of um, two essays on analytical psychology. And uh, Jordan, are you seeing that in the right direction? I'm seeing a mirror image, but I... No, I'm seeing it in the right direction. It's the right okay. direction, yeah. You're, yeah. you're backwards, but... Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I definitely am. Okay, so... And I here. bought this version of it, so I can... Oh, cool. Think oh, right. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, I liked that you had the previous version, though, originally, because it showed us really how he would not be afraid of evolving the text when it has a successive publication. Yes, but it was very frustrating for me to follow because I, the, the literature was different. The, lang you know, the whole thing was different, and I couldn't follow along. Yeah. So and, I'm so glad that I figured this out. And I bought it as a used book. So it was very inexpensive. Yeah. 
Good. That's, that's yeah, I'm amazed like at it. how 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 high up there they are. I mean, some of them at 80 even. Um, yeah. I thought that the different text was a matter of uh, translation. I thought it was a different translation. Well, what I said when I was, we were talking about shadow and my index didn't have anything to do with shadow. The oh yeah, that's shadow. right. Um, yeah. So, and um, Skip said that there was a whole bunch of material about shadow. Yeah. So I thought I'm, I'm missing something here. Yeah, that's right. I'm thinking of another, another book that I was reading. I, uh, it was another one of Young's collected works, but somebody else in the group had a completely different translation and like the meaning was the same behind the paragraphs but the wording was i mean it almost sounded like a completely different book yes. you at the same place but how you get there was a completely different route well i don't know if we're on fire but <laughs> i hope not anyway um okay there is um a footnote here uh, which I will read to you. However, I cannot find it in the text. And so hopefully I will find it in the text. And it's footnote 13. This sentence was written during the First World War. I have left let it stand in its original form because it contains a truth which has been confirmed more than once in the course of history. This was written, that, that part was written in 1925. As present events show, the confirmation did not have to wait very long. Who wants this blind destruction? But we all help the demon to our last gasp. Oh, sancta simplicitas. And that was, that last part was written in 1942. So uh, somewhere in here we have a... There, it's, it's a third... A quarter inch and a half down the page. Uh, irrational devastation of culture. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The ninth line of the paragraph. Yes. One, two, three, six, seven, eight. Nine. Right oh, over I on see. the left. I see it. Uh, yeah, I even, actually, I haven't even marked it FN for footnote. Okay. I, I was that. even looking on the previous page because I couldn't see it before either okay so we may come back to this footnote but for now which changed over quite a period of time it seems so old heraclitus who was indeed a very great sage discovered the most marvelous of all psychological laws the regulative function of opposites he called it anantiodromia a running contrary wise by which he meant that sooner or later, everything runs into its opposite. Here, I would remind you of the case above of the American businessman, a beautiful example of an antiodromia. Thus, the rational attitude of culture necessarily runs into its opposite, namely the irrational devastation of culture. And that's what the footnote is about. Um, we should never identify ourselves with reason, for man is not and never will be a creature of reason alone, a fact to be noted by all pedantic culture mongers. <laughs> the irrational, <laughs> the, uh, Jordan Peterson, <laughs> are you hearing this? Um, the irrational cannot be and must not be extirpated. The gods cannot and must not die. I said just now that there seems to be something, a kind of super, superior power in the human psyche, and that if this is not the idea of God, then it is the belly. <laughs> Interesting. I wanted to express the fact that one, of, one or the other basic instinct or complex of ideas will invariably concentrate upon itself the greatest sum of psychic energy and thus force the ego into its service. As a rule, the ego is drawn into this focus of energy so powerfully that it identifies with it and thinks it desires and needs nothing further. In this way, a craze develops, a monomania or possession, 
and acute one-sidedness, which most seriously imperils the psychic equilibrium. Without doubt, the capacity for such one-sidedness is the secret of success of, of, of a sort, for which reason our civilization assiduously strives to foster it. The passion, the piling up of energy in these mono monomanias is what the ancients called a god, and in common speech we still do the same. Do we not say, he makes a god of this or that? A man thinks that he wills and chooses and does not notice that he is already possessed, that his interest has become the master, arrogating all power to itself. Such interests are indeed gods of a kind, which, once recognized by the many, gradually form a church and rather and gather a herd of believers about them. This, uh, this we then call an organization. It is followed by a dis disorgan disorganizing reaction, which aims to drive out the devil with Beelzebub. The enantiodromia that always threatens when a movement attains to undisputed power offers no solution of the problem, for it is just as blind in its disorganization as it was in its organization. Okay. Comments? <clears throat> yeah, I just want to draw attention to the line where he says, I said just now that there seems to be something, a kind of superior power in the human psyche, and that if this is not the idea of God, then it is the, quote, belly. And it's really interesting. I don't think I'll be able to find the page exactly, but I can kind of zero in on the notion. Um, he was talking about, I think it was in the first or second chapter, that there was this strange physiological thing that happened in the case of the young woman where she was she was having um I, I guess her her neurosis manifested in some kind of physiological issue with her throat or something mm -hmm. like that where she quote yeah. couldn't swallow the truth of the situation or something like that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think that's deeply deeply interesting and there are also other places where young echoes that same notion or is, is pointing to that notion as well a quote i've heard tossed around i can't place it but he says you know the gods haven't died zeus has just left olympus and now lives in the solar plexus and all of this other stuff and yeah also, also edinger talks about you know the god image falling into the body you're falling into matter and all of this stuff and i think it's really interesting to note that like you know how many people make a make a god of the body nowadays Absolutely. Well, yeah, embody embodiment really has become one of the healthiest ways to work with spirituality. I mean, instead of the body denial, which went along for so long, I think you're on the money with the then is the belly because the solar plexus being the golden center. But also, I wonder if that belly in quotes means looking up at the firmament, the bottom of the firmament into heaven kind of thing, belly. Um don't know if that makes so much sense, but I wanted to call attention um, to um, the irrational cannot be and must not be extirpated. And, you know, extirpated means, you know, rooting out and completely destroyed. And so he's making a comment there that the irrational is, is integral to this and to life itself, um, the not knowing as it were. Yeah. yeah, but I think he could just as, and of course, you know, I don't mean to get into a huge philosophical debate here. I'm not going to like plant my stake in rationality and <laughs> wore it out on that. That's <laughs> but what I, am, what, I, wrong place. what I am going to say is that, you know, if somebody it's kind of there, they have a propensity for irrationality, then rationality would be kind of the way to, that would be the compensating thing then. Well, completely. I mean, I, 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 is kind of the dominating um, propensity for most people. 
prices. But I mean, often, that's, that's, often I don't think rationality that's... is is the solution for many people. This is why mm -hmm. Jordan Peterson gets in the middle of it because for a psychotherapist, and I speak out of turn because Marilyn is one, but and so I'll ask for her comment next. But um, you know, Jer Jordan Peterson's logos is you know, the logic that often gets people out of a very irrational uh, psychic situation. And uh, a doctor properly trained, I think, can, can guide someone out of a very irrational situation that's causing them much harm. Um, yeah, but if, if Jordan Peterson has the appeal that he does to so many people because he presents a rational road out of irrationality that can only mean that we're not as rational and as advanced and as advanced as we would like to think we are of course and that's very clear in his following <laughs> so, well and the the flip side i think the flip side within that with jordan peterson is that most of those people who are in need of so much rationality it's because they're trying to make a reason for everything which is irrational and so yes. they're, they're getting a lack of, they're getting a rationality as their mode of being by trying to find meaning and be rational in everything, which is basically the man with the Midas touch starts his soul. I mean, if you can solidify every single thing, there's a piece of you that disappears, namely the soul. And yes. that, that then drives people nuts. You know, we're all crazy, but nuts is different. Yeah. If you can turn everything into gold, it's not always great. If yeah. You turn, if you turn your daughter into gold, that's she's not going to support you in your old age. So she, Marilyn, she won't ask for birthday cake, though. <laughs> yeah. So Marilyn, did you want to comment on this? Um, it's I'm not clear what it means. It's not. Well, very, that, it's not very clear to me. So I'm not sure. Okay. Um, all right. So let's basically. What does it mean when he says you drive out the devil with Beelzebub? What does anybody know what that means? I don't know what that means. Do, okay. Do My you, understanding. Is that from Faust? Isn't that from Faust though? It might be. Uh, yeah. And so there's kind of a, um, there's a um, pop, uh, pop culture with Faust. So with theater, yeah. with some, and honestly, as my dad used to say, I mean, he's a biblical scholar. He's like, in that kind of thing, driving out the devil with the eels above is creating a false idol instead of addressing the devil. So you're, you're actually distracting from the point. And in that sense, there's a bait and switch that's going on to still keep people onto objects, be as above, rather than the actual devil kind of thing. Right, or, or a devil in disguise. A devil, right, you know, devil in disguise. Who yeah. shows up in some way that you think there's devilishness, but it's not just devilishness. It actually is paired with the devil. So there mm -hmm. is true evil. And, and, I, mean, and I think he's bringing up the notion of evil here in a way. I, I think yeah. in a way. And honestly, too, I always have to kind of, fall back a little bit on a sense of humor with Hades, for example, because huh. he has he has his dog Cerberus. But the name Cerberus with a C, C-E-R-B-E-R-U-S, comes from Carberry, which is K-E-R-B-E-R-E, -E, which means spotted. So Hades literally named his dog Spot. I mean, <laughs> yeah. so how bad can that be? I mean, if I could, if dog I could, the dog. <laughs> Yeah, go, go ahead, Nick. What were you going to say? I think that uh, Beazel Love is a later iteration of the name Baal from the Bible. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, Baal was a way of, of kind of rooting out the, the evil in your neighbors of saying, you know, they're worshipers of Baal. They create false idols of pagan gods. Mm -hmm. We should root them out because they're not on board with our, you know, Christian or... or um, the ethos of Judaism or something like that. So it's it's more or less an illusion to scapegoating people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Driving out the devil. Yeah, the false idols yeah. or the yeah. 
you don't, you're not congruent with our organization. Therefore you, we got to get you, you know, we got to weed you out. I mean, Precisely. and that's, that's, that childish fear, frankly. I mean, when it gets down to it, because there's no difference in that, that is going to starve itself after a while. I mean, too much of the same, same, same makes itself baseline averaged out boring, um, lifeless even. I mean, think about the lines that lead up to this. Such interests are indeed gods of a kind, which once recognized by the many, gradually form a church and gather a herd, herd, shepherd of believers mm -hmm. about them. Yep. Certain and then we call this an organization. Yeah, but Christianity, big time. No, it, this we don't call an organization. <laughs> well, no, we're, ju no, we're just that's reading. Next, that's the next sentence. He said, this we then call an organization. He generalizes yeah. it. Yeah, and what's interesting but, is the believers could go into religion, and that's fine. But as soon as it becomes an organization, I think that's where the problem the problem arises. Because um, then organizations have bylaws and rules, and well, here we go: catechism and commandments, and and leaders, and leaders. Yeah, mm -hmm. like Nick said, shepherd. There's a herd. Well, who's the shepherd? I mean, right. that that was good that you added that shep in front of the herd there. Well, the, what struck me about this, when it said organization, I got caught up in that word because I work for a very large organization in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And there was, so, there was one leader that was kind of, he was like the God and everybody worshiped him. And it was really, I was not involved. I was not a scientist. I wasn't in that group. And I saw myself separate from it. And they seemed, there were some things they did that I saw that looked absolutely crazy to me. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, they all wanted to sit next to this one leader and there was not physically enough space for, mm. for them to, they, they didn't have enough room because they all had, mm -hmm. each one had, had their staff so it got so crowded and I tried to point out to them, if one more person comes in the organization, it's gonna explode. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And then that's what happened because mm -hmm. they were so tied to this one leader, everybody physically wanted to be close to him. And that's what this struck me. So they saw him as a leader and he took that on. Oh, of course I'm the leader. And then, it it was it was um, it was self defeating, and mm -hmm. I, that's the sense I got from this. It becomes self defeating if you uh, maybe I'm taking it too literally, but that's what it felt like to me. That if you make this person be the ruler in the organization or whatever, you're doomed to fail. Well, I I think that's right on, Marilyn, and I mean it reminds me of Skip's story of the general who said, "Oh, there go my people. I must follow them." That's the exact opposite of it there. That's exactly right. That's exactly. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's a great call there because um, they're actually that much density around his flame is going to snuff him out and it's gone. I mean, it gets too much around it and it gets constrained and incarcerated and then he becomes brittle because then if he changes that upsets them. I mean, in a way it, it decreases, I find it makes the system brittle, um, you know, less able to be flexible to adapt as it moves along. That's right. It was totally inflexible. Yeah. And I, and I wonder if that's what he's referring to. It becomes inflexible. It's not workable. Yeah. Well, yeah and the, it, when he says it's followed by the disorganizing reaction, I always love it when in philosophy in college, we start talking about anarchy. And someone would inevitably bring up, yeah, 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 we always have anarchy, and then they win, and then they go, oh, now what? And what do they do? They have to put a government in place. So it's, it's a kind of anarchy to me is oftentimes, um, in that sense, that kind of example, just at a greater scale, that basically puts itself out. Because, for example, revolution, say, look at France, has a point. Change occurs. But with anarchy, it's just overthrow. And then there's a vacuum. And then the same system only has the same decades and centuries long habits. So what is it going to do? It naturally begins to fill back in. 
the same system before with just different suspects and different names. You guys okay if I read the next chapter? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead. Okay. The only person who escapes, escapes the grim law of an antiodromia is the man who knows how to separate himself from the unconscious, not by repressing it, for then it simply attacks him from the rear, but by putting it clearly before him as that which he is not. Mm -hmm. This prepares the for the school and the scylla and the cherubdis problem described above. The patient must learn to differentiate what is ego and what is non-ego, i.e. collective psyche. In this way, he finds the material to which he will henceforth have to accommodate himself. His energy, until now, laid up in unserviceable forms and path unserviceable and pathological forms has come into its proper sphere. It is essential in differ differentiating the ego from the non-ego that a man should be firmly rooted in his ego function. That is, that is, he must fulfill his duty to life so as to be in every respect a viable member of the community. All that he neglects in this respect falls into the unconscious and reinforces its position so that he is in danger of being swallowed up by it, by the penalty, but the penalties of this are heavy. As Sinesius opined of old, it is just the inspired soul, the pneumatike suke, who becomes God and demon, and as such suffers the divine punishment of being torn asunder like Zagreus. This was what Nietzsche experienced at the onset of his personality. In Antiodromia, means being torn asunder into pairs of opposites, which are the attributes of God, and hence also of the godlike man who owes his godlikeness to overcoming his gods. As soon as we speak of the collective unconscious, we find ourselves in a sphere and concerned with a problem which is altogether precluded in the practical analysis of young people or of those who have remained infantile too long. Wherever the father and mother imagos have still to be overcome, wherever there is still a little bit of wherever there's a little bit of life still to be conquered, which is the natural possession of the average man, then we had better make no mention of the collective unconscious and the problem of opposites. But once the parental transferences and the youthful illusions have been mastered or are <clears throat> at least ripe for mastery, then we must speak of these things. We are here outside the range of Freudian and Adlerian reductions. We are no longer concerned with how to remove the obstacles to a man's profession or to his marriage or to anything that means a widening of his life, but are confronted with the task of finding a meaning that will enable him to continue living at all, a meaning more than blank resignation and mournful retrospect. I'd like to add a quote of Jung's to that in regards to the mother and father Imago. Um, it comes from man and his symbols and I don't have a page citation or paragraph, but I just came across one of my platforms this morning. Um, Jung says, once the individual has passed his initial test and can enter into the mature phase of life, the hero myth loses its relevance. The hero's symbolic death becomes, as it were, the achievement of that maturity. And so all about the rites of passage there, where, you know, ready, the transference has occurred. Yeah, that's a good one. I asked, or I tried to ask B what the quote was, but I, I couldn't find it, uh, Jordan. How, how long ago did she put that up? Because that, that was on Sophia Cycles, and that's... Yeah, that was, this, it came across this morning. She may have reposted it from previous, so it may not have moved itself forward in, in her, um, in her, her queue. Hmm. Okay. So I uh, actually, that's a good point. Cause I couldn't find it either when I went back. And so I just took, I just took out my phone and took a shot real quick. Um, all right. That's what I did too. And I, I, mean, <laughs> I went back uh, a long time. And I, did I laugh because it. my newer iPad, I don't even know how to do a screenshot yet. So I'm always pulling out my phone. <laughs> I feel like I'm a caveman in technology now. Okay, so you, yeah, I couldn't find when she posted it either. Okay, 
Try Actually, let me look closer at. Um... While you guys are trying to find that, there are a few the... things I'd like to point out in this paragraph. Yeah, go ahead. And this is, I don't know if this is psychologically relevant, but it's just interesting to me that the Greek um, included here, pneumatike suke, it's so interesting mm -hmm. that the operative part of that word is pneuma. And he uses it here to refer to inspired soul. I know that we've thrown around that word a lot in the past. It certainly gets used a lot in Young's work, but it's just interesting that it also applies to words like inspired and stuff like that. And it takes on certainly much more of a connotative meaning than used in the Greek. Um, it does. And tell me, tell me about the suke part. Um, Cause that was, I got the pneumatica right off the bat and then I, I see the sigh and I went through and I, I went, I haven't seen that. So tell me about the suke part of the pneumatica suke. What do you mean? What about it? I mean, is it, it uh, kind of homonymal, homonymal for psyche? I mean. Right. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, yeah. the Y is pronounced more like a U. In mm -hmm. So, so physis, where we get physics or physical is, is physis. Okay, psyche. so we basically have it. It's synonymous with psyche in a way. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. It, okay. Yeah, in Greek is pronounced suke. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but then then he goes on to talking about Nietzsche, and he does some really really great wordplay here, where he says, um, "Let's see here." Man, who. An antiodromia means being torn asunder into pairs of opposites, which are the attributes of the God, and hence also of the godlike man, or the, the Ubermensch, or mm -hmm. Nietzsche, the Superman, who has godlikeness to overcoming his gods. And it's so interesting that, okay, so in the first place, right when Nietzsche got really ill, he started writing letters and he signed all of his letters, either Dionysus. Uh -huh. The one who inspires people being torn apart completely, dismembered, mm -hmm. or the crucified one, or Christ, and all of these strange things. He was just being utterly torn apart himself. Mm -hmm. But also his whole theme, and thus, thus spoke Zarathustra, is going down. And somewhere mm -hmm. in that he says, I cannot help but to love man for whom life is nothing but a going down and a going across. Yeah, and he, he referred to the down going with a capital D a bunch. Right, yeah, and it had nothing to do with overcoming anything for him. It had to mm -hmm. do with into and coming off the mountain and all of this strange stuff. So it's just a very, very masterful uh, use, of, use of language there. Well, and actually, I think Annabelle started, off, started us off with that, with the hermit, because the hermit is a consummate down going card. It's a going, it's not necessarily down like scuba diving. It's down being within, going down into the creative wellspring of the unconscious. And that hermit is that is a, a visual metaphor of that process. Well, and the hermit also is at the peak. And I think that that, in a sense, embodies what we're talking about with these opposites. You can't mm -hmm. go all the way down until as you're all the way at the top. Um, that was one of the things in my studying that card this week has been um, no one gets so high on those snowy peaks as the hermit does. Well, that's, yeah, and that goes right along with Jung's quote that says, um, a tree cannot grow to heaven unless its roots reach to hell. And uh, honestly, psychologically, structurally, architecturally, that makes sense from just a cantilever. If you go, to, there's the Daedalus Icarus piece. If you go too high, you don't have the roots of properly attached feathers. So you fall. You're overextended like a cantilever that's gone too far. Whereas Icarus goes up and goes down, but he loses his son. So it's a different down. But there's a, that overextension cantilever, like you said, of you can't go that deep until you've been that high or you can't go that high until you yeah. have those depths. Yeah, in Buddhism, there's the lotus, which also is the same thing, that the roots have to go, well, not go, they have to start from so deep into sediment and um, 
you know, kind of questionable spaces down below in order to achieve that radiance and brightness and enlightenment above. So yeah, I, I remember on, on any team when, you know, everything just went to heck. I mean, just boom. And someone's like, well, Jordan, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to grow a lotus out of this mud. Yes. So where do we start? And someone would invariably chime in. Isn't wouldn't that be with the roots? It's like, mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that's a perfect example. Mm-hmm. And so, also with the lotus, look at the beauty, the yeah. the lush brightness of the the white, bright yellow gold on top of this mud. You know, there's anti, there's the contrast right there of an anteater drum yeah, in one one. Being, I mean, the roots are the dark, and the top is the light. Uh huh. And the roots are a sort of tangle, and the and the petals are very organized, very balanced mm-hmm. uh, shape and um, kind of geometry. Geometry, actually, yeah, completely overtly. I mean, it's. I you think can take some a- of your cards are like that, Jordan, aren't they? Because I remember when we were working in the tarot, there was a lot of that geometry that you were using. That, that mm-hmm. and, and I actually this, yeah. drew paint the whole, drew painted the whole thing on my Archicad architectural drawing system. Oh, right. On, pur- on purpose. AutoCAD? Just, AutoCAD? No, Archicad. It, it was, Archicad. A, Archicad. It was okay. basically the industry standard AutoCAD, but in Europe. Right. And I found it more intuitive. Same price. It's Right. <laughs> but, um, but I just felt it did more. But, um, it was interesting because it, it gave me a powerful limit and constraint, even in that mud and brightness piece of not slowing me down, but keeping the shapes and the forms visible instead of, you know, long flourishes that can like sumi brush go in and out of one another. In a sense, it kept the flower present. Um, okay, okay. Which, I think I, we're getting a little far, far afield here. So, <laughs> in, in fairness to yeah. everyone, let us. Uh, we're up to. Shall I read one fourteen? Yeah, go ahead. Paragraph one fourteen. Our life is like the course of the sun. In the morning, it gains continually in strength until it reaches the zenith height of high noon. Then comes the enantiodromia. The steady forward movement no longer denotes an increase, but a decrease in strength. Thus, our task in handling a young person is different from the task of handling an older person. In the former case, the younger, it is enough to clear away all the obstacles that hinder expansion and ascent. In the latter, which is older, we must nurture everything that assists the descent. An experienced youth thinks one can let old people go because not much more can happen to them anyway. They have their lives behind them and they are no better than, a pet, than petrified pillars of the past. But it is a great mistake to suppose that the meaning of life is exhausted with the period of youth and expansion. That, for example, a woman who has passed the menopause is finished, in quotes. The afternoon of life is just as full of meaning as the morning, only its meaning and purpose are different. Footnote 14. Maybe oh oh it's from the stages of life such so wow tiny that's the smallest Jungian footnote I've ever seen. Um, let's see, its meaning the afternoon of life is just as full of meaning as the morning. Only its meaning and purpose are different. See also the titles of the stages of life. Man has two aims. The first is the natural aim, the begetting of children, and the business of protecting the brood. To this belongs the acquisition of money and social position. When this aim has been reached, a new phase begins, the cultural aim. For the attainment of the former, we have the help of nature, and on top of that, education. For the attainment of the latter, little or nothing helps. Often, indeed, a false ambition survives, and that an old man wants to be a youth again, or at least feels he must behave like one, although in his heart he can no longer make believe. This is what makes the transition from a natural to the cultural phase so terribly difficult and bitter for many people. The cling to the illusion of youth or to their children, hoping to salvage in this way a very last little scrap 
of youth. One sees it, especially in mothers, who find their sole meaning and their children and imagine they will sink into a bottomless void when they have to give them up. No wonder that many bad neuroses appear at the onset of life's afternoon. It is a sort of second puberty, another storm and stress period, not infrequently accompanied by tempests of passion, the dangerous age, in quotes. But the problems that crop up at this age are no longer to be solved by the old recipes. The hand of this clock cannot be put back. What youth found and must find outside, the man of life's afternoon must find within himself. Here we face new problems, which often cause the doctor no light headache. <laughs> Comments? Well, it's no light headache. <laughs> this reminds me of, again, rite of, rite of passage, where, I mean, it's 14 to 17, we should be doing that. And that's put upon us. But then at 27 and 42, it's our job to put them upon us, ourselves. Um, 27 more within the context, typically, of an organization. But at 42, I think I've read articles where psychologists say that's where neuroplasticity is at its verge point, where if you're creative, it will continue. And if not, it starts to concretize or cure and become less, less flexible. So like the must, the doctor causes the doctor no light headache. I mean, that's, I love the humor there, but at the same time, um, if people aren't creative, then they're, those neuroses are ingrained. Like, you know, just like inclusions and, you know, ridges and marble. I mean, you can't take them out. They're just, they're indelible. Yeah. You have to keep creating. That's clear. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, this is the brilliant work that Colleen has done um, low these last 50 years because she knows this and, and uh, has taught this and, and, you know, embellished many lives that way. Um, you know, I would, every time, if, if I think about Colleen, Colleen's, excuse me, Colleen's mode of being, it always reminds me of the Turkish proverb that's a heart in love with beauty never grows old. And, you know, that's, that's a self life affirming heart there going on, continuing, reinventing, replenishing, refueling itself. Definitely. Um, well, I, I think that it's fair to say, and I have a I have a dog in this fight, uh, that you know you can come up with something that's of value to culture and society at any age, and um, mm -hmm. you know this. This YouTube channel is a, is an example of that, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, because people are paying attention to it for whatever reason. So, anyway, uh, let's uh, let's go on. I, Why I, don't I read the sense that he's using culture and perhaps a kind of a, a a nuanced sense here or something? I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but what what i think of culture and how culture seems to be used in the line where he says this is what makes the transition from the natural to the cultural phase so terribly difficult and bitter for many people almost that that almost doesn't align with what i think of regarding the term culture i, I think you're right i think he, there is a nuanced yeah. level of, he's playing subtlety because he doesn't go so far as to say that then the person in the afternoon of life understands how terribly difficult it would be to move culture. Um, the, you know, the idealism has now become pesky idealism oftentimes, and that zeal is missing. Um, but he doesn't go in. I think you're right. He's being very, very nuanced because he doesn't actually go into the finer grain of, of the, of the what's and the why's of just that word culture there 
it, it implies a larger scale. Um, but at what scale is he insinuating culture would be a question. I also um, Miles is making a, like Miles actually. is making a very interesting point here that we ought to highlight. He says in Antiodromium, in 1977, Canary Islands, a KLM Boeing 747 collides into a Pan Am Boeing 747. In an instant, the epitome of rational order and complexity is converted into irrational disorder and demolition. That's an angiotromia for sure. Well, yeah, and that's that's a good example of a crash, literally, of an antiodromia rather than an evolutionary transition forming into the yeah. other. Which right. is a really good example to bring up because it it's it's we're I guess you know, and now that I think about it, I was playing more all in pretty pictures, but that that's the the reality of that's not so pretty, but it's necessary to understand the intensity of that impactful version. So uh, let's go on. Uh, yeah, let's Bell, read the next wanna... paragraph because he, he extends this here. It's, I may have. Shall I read that next? Um, 115. 115. The yeah. transition from morning to afternoon means a revaluation of the earlier values. There comes the urgent need to appreciate the value of the opposite of our former ideals, to perceive the error in our former convictions, to recognize the untruth in our former truth, and to feel how much antagonism and even hatred lay in what until now had passed for love. Not a few of those who are drawn into the conflict of opposites jettison everything that had previously seemed to them good and worth striving for. They try to live in complete opposition to their former ego. Changes of profession, divorces, religious convulsions, apostases of every description are the symptoms of this swing over to the opposite. The snag about a radical conversion into one's opposite is that one's former life suffers repression and thus produces just as unbalanced a state as existed before when the counterparts of the unconscious virtues and values were still repressed and unconscious. Just as before, perhaps neurotic disorders arose because the opposing fantasies were unconscious so now other disorders arise through the repression of former idols. It is of course a fundamental mistake to imagine that when we see the non-value in a value or the untruth in a truth, the value or the truth ceases to exist. It has only become relative. Everything human is relative because everything rests on an inner polarity for everything is a phenomenon of energy. Energy necessarily depends on a pre-existing polarity without which there could be no energy. There must always be high and low, hot and cold, etc., so that the equilibrating, equilibrating process, which is energy can take place. Therefore, the tendency to deny all previous values in favor of their opposite is just as much of an exaggeration as the earlier one-sidedness. And insofar as it is a question of rejecting universally accepted and in indubitable values, the result is a fatal loss. One who acts in this way empties himself out with his values as Nietzsche has already said. Mm. I just want to point out the line here where he says uh, disorders arise through the repression of former idols. Yeah. So just double back to say that that jumped that jumped out at me too because he was using the word idols in the middle of 
not talking about anything that seemed to be related to idolatry or the gods that he had been speaking it's a, about. It's a reference back to Beelzebub back, as well. Yeah. Because there's exactly. mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Yeah, it's the, you guys got to let go. that you right gotta, in there. Yeah, it's like, you guys got to let go of that stuff, he's saying, you know? Yeah. So what year was Einstein's theory of relativity and what, what year was this? It's an interesting... About 1915 for both. 13, 15? Yeah. yeah. 1915. For both? Yeah. 1914. So there you go. So that's yeah, a the, Eureka moment, right? I mean, yeah, there's a collective everyone. unconscious moment going on there between the two. Right. Theory of relativity and a phenomenon of energy. And energy necessarily depends on pre existing polarity. That sounds like Einstein. And then Einstein famously right after that said, um, the other definition of insanity is trying to, trying to get new results following the same yeah. processes. I mean, it's like, yeah. yeah. Einstein and Young knew one another and apparently um, Young also treated Einstein's son. Huh. Really? Yeah, for a short period of time. Was that in, well, in uh, Kusnacht or Zurich or somewhere? Was that? Yeah, I yeah. think they were both professors at the uh, Zurich Polytechnical Institute. Sweet. Right at the same time. That's you know, what's interesting is then you take that and then you take um, uh, whose daughter, um, not T.S. Eliot, um, who wrote Ulysses. Sure. Um, James Joyce. Yeah, James Joyce's daughter. So take these high and mighty creatives, Joyce and create and Einstein and look at the shadow they drown in trying to walk out of the parental imago. Yeah. I mean, there's a piece of the greater your parents are, the, you know, the harder it is to, you know, it's, I, it's like, wow, I'm so glad you finally walked out of that shadow. That was a big one. So if I look at Joyce and Einstein too, that's, there's something interesting in terms of patient treatment. He's treating the, the high and mighty creative offspring, their children. <laughs> well, just today, coincidentally, as we say in the normal world or not in the astral realm, I was reading some Alice in Wonderland, as I do very frequently. And I was reading what I usually read is my Martin Gardner annotated. And I happened upon the intro the uh, epigraph to his introduction, Martin Gardner's introduction, which is, quote, wipe your glosses with what you know, a quote from James Joyce. Mm. Mm -hmm. and Did you read that again? Yeah, please. <laughs> Wipe your glosses with what you know. Mm. James so Joyce. A, a gloss in this case is something that you kind of believe, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, and it's related to the word glossary. I think mm. very much so because Lewis Carroll was so much involved with playing with words and the meanings of words and recreating them and naming things so that they had various uh, subtle meanings. Anyway. Um, well, yeah, he had so many of my day today. <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. And so many of Lewis Carroll's just word choices. There'd be a whole subtle nuance crossroad in that word. Exactly. I mean, well, and that's what I mean, Martin Gardner was doing. He was taking the whole thing apart and putting it back together again from the viewpoint of essentially Western civilization from a Victorian England, uh, Victorian English day-to-day -day practical point of view, right? Yeah, and if we Father stay on William, the, I mean, all that stuff. Yeah. If we stay on the Lewis Carroll theme to keep to their rationality and their rationality. Definitely. I mean, one of Lewis Carroll's famous quotes was, it's very important to your health to try and believe several important, several impossible things before breakfast each morning. So <laughs> there's there's bringing the irrationality in with your cereal or your coffee before you go into the rational day. That's right. that's a, he's doing the anetiodromia just in the course of a day. Exactly. And, and we have what we have in this conversation right now is Einstein's kind of 
supposedly rational scientific approach butting right up against nonsense of Lewis Carroll and Finnegan's Wake and all the rest of the nonsense of, you know. Well, and it's funny with the nonsense. I mm-hmm. Last year, at one point, I reread, reread Finnegan's Wake. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I reread Ulysses. And I finally you know got... You have a good time. <laughs> yeah, you know, take a field trip. and But I did it because something came, came to me. My English teacher in high school mm. would always... She'd always say... You know, best laid plans of mice and men, gang after glay, you know, and that means often go awry. And I, I, I always said, I don't think it needs to be translated. And she right. would say, why? And I said, no, I don't know, but I, yeah. but I know. <laughs> yeah. And last year it came to me that if I just speak like I have an Irish accent <laughs> and, and maybe a few Guinness in me, then it's not gang after get a glay. It's gone off the ugly. It's going <laughs> off an ugly, which is often go awry. So I started, I read Finnegan's Wake out loud. Oh, and right. it's as if he wrote it phonetically with the accents of the people on the street and in the bars. And it, it's, it, it was interesting to me because it, it didn't make any more sense, but I could understand okay. the words. So, so let's come back to when Andrea drove me now. <laughs> just, we just had just, a little. <laughs> just trying to, just trying to stay grounded a little bit. So, uh, do you want to do one sixteen, Nick? Sure. Marilyn, do you have the book and would you like to read? Okay. <clears throat> the point is not conversion into the opposite but conversion of previous values together with the recognition of their opposites. Naturally, this means conflict and self-division. It is understandable enough that one should shrink from it philosophically as well as morally. Hence the alternative sought more often than conversion into the opposite is a convulsive stiffening into the previous attitude. It must be admitted that in the case of the elderly man, this is a phenomenon of, little, of no little merit, however disagreeable it may be. At least they do not become renegades. They remain upright. They do not fall into muddle-headedness, nor yet into the mud. They are no defaulters, but are merely dead wood, or to put it more rigidly, pillars of the past but the accompanying symptoms, the rigidity, the narrow-mindedness, the standoffishness of these laudatory temporis acti are unpleasantness, are unpleasant not to say harmful. For their method of espousing a truth or any other value is so inflexible and violent that their unmannerliness repels more than the truth attracts so that the result is the opposite of the intended good. The fundamental cause of their rigidity is the fear of the problem of opposites. They have a foreboding and secret dread of the sinister brother of Medardus. Therefore, there must be only one truth and one guiding principle of action. And that must be absolute, otherwise it affords no protection against the impending disaster, which is sensed everywhere, save in themselves. But actually the most dangerous revolutionary is within ourselves and all must realize this is who uh, wish to pass over safely into the second half of life. Certainly this means exchanging the apparent security we have so far enjoyed for a condition of insecurity or internal division of contradictory conviction. The worst feature of all is that there appears to be no way out of this condition. Tertium non datur, says logic. There is no middle way. And boy, does that ring true. Um, I've seen a lot of people as they've gotten older, so clinging to what they believe, they can't see beyond it. 
And it's mm-hmm. very, very difficult for them um, to see into, into the same world that everybody else is moving forward into. Mm-hmm. And it can be quite, come quite tragic. But the Titanic oh. sank and they claimed to the ship instead of the lifeboat. That's right. I have yeah, seen, that does. Pardon me. Ring so true. And so that rings so true. I'm yeah. Keep going. But. Well, I've seen it. Um, I've seen where people they they can't be with technology or they don't understand what's happening with the being vaccinated. They're just stuck in their way of thinking, and um, so maybe it served them well when they were younger. And I wonder if this is what he's trying to say, or this is what he's saying. It served them well, but because it served them well, they stay with it and then they can't move forward out of it because they're trapped into what served them well at one time. You know, and I wonder if they, like a snake, shed their skin, but stay in that dead skin so that they get further and further inside encased in all these dead layers that don't work anymore because of just the, the fear of letting go. And, and I've seen the opposite. I've seen some people who are quite elderly who are, well, I don't want to say Colleen, she's not elderly, she's of no age, but people who are <laughs> of an age and they, um, they just move forward, nothing stops them. They just keep moving. I just heard about this today, in fact, um, someone asked this elderly man um, if, if he, what, he, what channels he watches on TV or if he sees any movies that are good. And his comment was, I don't have time for that. I'm too busy. I have to finish what I've been trying to accomplish, which is he's writing books on physics. So he doesn't have time. He's moving forward. And to me, that is a beautiful example. It, but it I do, is. I do. I see people who become very rigid and I see people who move forward. And um, it's amazing to me to see th- there's like no middle ground. Either they're one way or they're the other. I don't see much of a middle ground. You know, you know, it's interesting you say that, but the guy with physics, what a beautiful example. Last week here on the plaza, I was um, just took a break and I had a smoothie sitting over on a bench and, and this, this, this older woman, purple, purple hair, not because of a bad dye. Like this is, she dyed it this way with some reds and some, and, and she was stylish. She was wearing, she, you could tell was having so much fun with her life. And I mean, even her glasses, I'm like, I want those glasses and I don't even wear glasses. I mean, other than my reading glasses, well, this little girl who was maybe 10 or 12 walked up to her and she goes, you look awesome and you look eccentric. I can't wait to be your age so I can do that too. And I don't have to listen to my parents. And she said, she goes, honey, you don't just all of a sudden turn 80 and get eccentric. This took 79 years of eccentricity <laughs> practice. I suggest you start now. So, you know, and the, the girl's mom was right behind him going, like, you just created a problem because, you know, this woman had presence like nobody's business and she obviously knew how to dress. But I just love that. of it. You don't just wake up all of a sudden when you're older and you can be eccentric. She said this took decades of, you know, 79 years of eccentricity practice. It's true. And that's beautiful. It's beautiful. She's she's fully alive. You know, and she walks by and she, she looks over, you know, her light, eyes have light. I mean, she's, she's present. That was true for my father till 101. Wow. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I mean, he, um, and in that previous paragraph, the thing about the stages of life, um, my father was 70 when my daughter was born. So when she, When he died, she was 31. Um, But he didn't just kind of sit back and wait for the grandkids to sit around his chair and, you know, tell them old stories. He was out there discovering things. And and if she would come to visit, he would plan out a whole program, you know, what they were going to do. 
Nice. And, um, and he taught a Bible class and he, <clears throat> well, I think I've told this class that he was going for walks with Jesus. You know? Well, I have no this doubt about new, that. Yeah, this was a new activity for him. Yeah, I mean, even... But that was his dream life and his waking life, you know, kind of the veil uh, became very thin, but it, but it wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't a sort of law. I mean, I guess I was going to say a loss of sense. I guess we're in that realm of sense and nonsense here that, that he had this curiosity and um, vitality that allowed him to accept a lot of those, um, mm -hmm. you know, dream realities and just incorporate them in his waking realities. Yeah, without being a liminal liminal yeah. erosion of the boundaries at all, like at in all. Parkinson's, it it's, it, it sounds like he was fully healthy. And oh well, we have some. Well, this is some more carnival content. This is let's use it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Go go ahead, Nick. Um, hmm. you know, I I'm just thinking about several things that you all have said in the past couple of minutes, and and working that into some of my own thoughts as well, and. Um, you know, it's interesting to think about the role that that a belief and opinion play versus knowing or knowledge. Mm. I think it's, you know, painfully evident that everybody has their own opinion and their own beliefs ranging from informed to utterly uninformed and uh, completely deleterious. And uh, when you ask yourself, what's the nature of belief? What's the role of belief? I think more often than not, it serves kind of a protective um, as a protective layering against the things that we don't understand, we'd rather not. Sure it is. Out. Sure it is. It's it's right. it's for it's the a, average man who can't think for himself. Right, needs to be right. able yeah, to, it's a, it's another uh, fence, but further out by the parent. I mean, to here's another limit to keep you safe, but then people get stuck within that corral. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting too. You know, I um. You know, my family, a lot of my older family members, God love them. I can hardly stand to be around them because, you know, every time I, I try to go be around people who are older than me, I'm always thinking, you know, like, God, I, I want to hear what you know. I want I want you to share some wisdom with me. Give me some insight about a long life lived. Like, I don't really, you know, pardon my French, but I don't give a shit about what you believe. You could think the moon is made of cheese or the earth is flat. Like, I don't care. <laughs> but I hope you have some wisdom after a long life lived mm -hmm. and you can tell me something that you know, perhaps rather than something that you believe. I mean, I can tell you things I believe too, but you know, they're not yeah, it's, worth anything at all, frankly. It's no and, fun. And it's just making me think of the James Joyce thing. Um, you know, whatever it was about wipe your glosses with what you know. Mm -hmm. There's also of course the young quote, I don't have to believe I know. But yeah. also in the platonic scheme, the platonic epistemology, there's also the role of, you know, there, there's a fourfold division of, of knowledge, starting with appearances and the way that appearances fool us into to forming erroneous beliefs. And then erroneous beliefs are transformed by, by understanding, by knowledge. So you don't have to believe because you know something. You know? And that tracks right through modern the appearance versus reality themes in modern literature. But yeah. only half the story, you know, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's leaving it's leaving the cave and the allegory of the cave or it's, you know, the, um, su the um, supremacy of, of knowledge over opinion or belief or faith mm. or what have you. So I just, I, that that all seemed relevant to what we've been talking about over the past couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to include that because that's. I think that's a, a kind of a notion that can be tracked through many different schools of thought. And I will, I will, let's, I do want to contribute. See if we can do uh, one radical thing, which is to get to the end of this chapter tonight. <laughs> and so, so that sounds good. I would like to contribute one short. Brief. I wanted to bring up Faust again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Dr. Faust. Uh, uh, okay. Right? Everybody that, get, I think that's gets, what Nick is talking about. Everybody gets two minutes to. <laughs> Go ahead, the, Jordan. No. The, Go ahead, Jordan. Their, That's, I, their well, mine's really and quick, and I really there. want to hear your Faust. And mine's really quick. I have a firm belief um, okay. that the world is not flat, and I have one anecdotal flat, one anecdotal fact for that. Um, the world is not flat. 
if the world was flat, cats would have already knocked everything off of it by now. <laughs> okay, like the, joke, the joke fell flat. <laughs> solid okay, proof. Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> I, I brought up Dr. Faustus, that's all. I, I, mm. I felt like what Nick was talking about very much related right back to what we talked about. Because again, the devil, Beelzebub, Dr. Faustus standing at his desk. What did he have his hand on the skeleton and he's studying and he's studying and he spins out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there could be, I, I, I don't know if it's completely relevant to that, but that's also an aspect of it. I'm not saying it's completely irrelevant either, but I think the situation in Faust is that Faust is a learned man with all of this knowledge and and no connection to life mm. so it's kind of a, it's kind of a, an inversion of the situation i think well and that's that's the midas touch starves the soul i mean no connection to life mm. all the knowledge all the gold but the experience right. is missing 17 117 yeah 117 oh. the okay. practical I'll, I'll read it go ahead uh, the practical necessities of treatment have therefore forced us to look for ways and means that might lead out lead out of this intolerable situation. Whenever a man is confronted by an apparently insurmountable obstacle, he draws back, he makes what is technically called a regression. He goes back to the times when, the, when he found himself in similar situations, and he tries to apply again the means that helped him then. But what helped in youth is of no use in age. What good did it do that American businessman to return to his former position? It simply wouldn't work. Uh, to the regression continues. Uh, so the regression continues right back into childhood. Hence the child uh, childishness of being elderly. Uh, of many elderly neurotics and to, ends up in the time before childhood that may sound strange, but in point of fact, it is not only logical, but all altogether possible. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, they're on the bottom of the other side of the mountain, the childhood on one side right. and the age in the other. Right. Well, I, as I've gone through, uh, you know, a series of business related turnarounds, and I can say that this is true. You can't go back. Um, yeah, you, you, know, you can't. Or, or, it's, or it's very difficult. You have to change your whole relationship to the, to the event. And, That's exactly uh, what he's saying about the American businessman, just to... Mm -hmm. Get yeah, context. He, there was in an earlier chapter, an American businessman started experiencing extreme hypochondria and had to um, leave his position in his company or something. Or no, 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 he retired. Yeah, he retired he and, and, and thought he'd be happy, and he was not. Yeah, right. Yeah, he had all all of the all of the all that one would hope they would have at the stage of retirement, and yet it didn't bring him anything. And he tried to go back to his position, but he also couldn't find the vitality and, and the, the juice to go back there with what he needed and essentially couldn't find a place for himself anywhere. And I think that Jung goes on to say that, you know, in such a situation with somebody's that far into life, pretty much all that can be done is that condition can be cared for until the end of life. Yeah. They have to live it to the end. That was yeah, in our last, I, last I week mean, or the I, week I before. Think he, I, th I think he's a little bit too, emphatic about this well okay. i think I mean, in that I, case he only said that because the man wouldn't listen to him necessarily i think he tried to say you know tell me one of your dreams let's talk through this or something like that but even still perhaps yes i think he was just well, more expressing that the guy was unwilling to pursue any other option yeah well that that is maybe may have been true with that individual but it it seems to me that um you know i've I've tried things um, in my career, which has been uh, 
very interesting. And, um, and, you know, I keep trying in a different way. Like I try painting, then I try or tried sculpture, then I tried painting. Uh, then I had three exhibits and I said, well, this isn't what I wanted it to be. And I couldn't pick it up again. I couldn't touch it. Um, but, but I did go through these different stages with it. And now I'm realizing that, oh, by the way, um, I am artistic, but I'm artistic about something else, which is about bringing people together and to making, making things mm -hmm. happen in a different kind of way. And um, I appreciate that you said he's too emphatic. I think I, I agree, but with a caveat that I think not so too emphatic, but it's too emphatic on the neurotic example and not on the example you just mentioned, because I know in my business as well, the same thing. There's, there, it's a gardener where, you know, churn the garden under with a rototiller consciously. I mean, and yeah. started the garden anew. Uh, yeah, completely try, different. try a different crop. Yeah, right. try a different crop. And right. so he, I do think the, the emphasis is a little heavy on the example of the neuroses, which may be more prevalent and more useful to people. But I think, I think there's not enough play on the people who don't fall prey to the neuroses and go, oh, I just shed a skin. I'm vulnerable. Be careful. But you got to keep going. And yeah. now I have to feel literally, I have a different skin. I have to feel things differently. So you learn to walk again or you run before right. you walk, however you do it. But right. And then, and then you may go back. I mean, I, I have a situation right now where, um, you know, I've had this relationship for 20 years with people that live in Kuala Lumpur. And it was, it went fallow for many years or, you know, it went very um, not so active. And lately mm -hmm. it's become mm -hmm. becoming more and more active and it's bringing me back in not to do the exact same thing I did before, mm -hmm. because before I was running a company, but now more advising a company mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it may lead to nothing. Uh, you know, about, well, probably more than half of my ventures have led to nothing. Uh, but I mean, I'll give you an example. For one year, I uh, sold bonsai trees. Okay, now why did I do that? Well, because friends of mine who were in a business um, liked bonsai trees and they, they got a... Um, uh, supply chain going of bonsai trees. I mean, literally these small trees that are typically pruned in Japan and, and then somebody buys them. And, you know, it got to the point where I, I literally had a nursery in my backyard or a, a greenhouse and I had bought a truck and, and so on. And I was driving these bonsai trees around to, um, around to nurseries and then what happened and it was cool i was having fun but what happened then was that the guy that was the supply chain died suddenly and and mm. therefore no no more supply and uh you know i had to just reinvent myself but you know that that happens that's a great example with a bonsai because you can't then turn around and plant some seeds and be back in business the next month i mean no, no. You, you've got decades on you know this right <laughs> like... that's right and you know and these were some pretty impressive bonsais i mean um, i suppose the cheapest ones were in the 20 to 30 dollar range uh but you know i i sold a couple of bonsais for uh, $1,200 each one time mm -hmm. that were just beautiful, right? And they were, they had been manicured, you know, kept for 
probably 25 mm. or 30 years at least. And uh, so, it, you know, it was interesting. It was artistic. It was teaching, you know, it was teach, using some of my skills in marketing and so on. It was before we had um, uh, social networking. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't use social networking. But, you know, stuff happens. And, you know, this very good friend of mine, just 48 years old, I think, just dropped out on the beach one day. Wow. Okay. Um, go on to the next event is... The, that, that, you know, when you, when that happens to you, go on to the next event. That's what you have to do. <laughs> do the next right thing. That's what it was right. Sunday morning. Thursday. Exactly. Do the next good thing. Yeah. So shall I 118? Yeah, go ahead. Paragraph 118. We mentioned earlier that the unconscious contains, as it were, two layers, the personal and the collective. The personal layer ends at the earliest memories of infancy, but the collective layer comprises the pre-infantile period, that is, the residues of ancestral life. Whereas the memory images of the personal unconscious are, as it were, filled out because they are images personally experienced by the individual, the archetypes of the collective unconscious are not filled out because they are forms not personally experienced. When, on the other hand, Psychic energy regresses, going beyond even the period of early infancy, and breaks into the legacy of ancestral life. The mythological images are awakened. These are the archetypes. And I'll read the footnote because it's lengthy and content laden. Footnote 15. The reader will note the admixture here of a new element in the idea of the archetypes not previously mentioned. This admixture is not a piece of unintentional obscurantism but a deliberate extension of the archetype by means of the karmic factor, which is so very important in Indian philosophy. The karma aspect is essential to a deeper understanding of the nature of an archetype. Without entering here into a closer description of this factor, I would like at least to mention its existence. I have been severely attacked by critics, critics for my idea of archetypes. I admit at once that it is a controversial idea and more than a little perplexing, but I have always wondered what sort of idea my critics would have used to characterize the empirical material in question. <laughs> so continuing, an interior spiritual world whose existence we never suspected opens out and displays contents which seem to stand in sharpest contrast to all our former ideas. These images are so intense that it is quite understandable why millions of cultivated persons should be taken in by theosophy and anthropos anthroposophy or anthroposophy. This sim happens simply because such modern Gnostic systems meet the need for expressing and formulating the wordless occurrences going on within ourselves better than any of the existing forms of Christianity, not accepting Catholicism. The latter is certainly able to express far more comprehensively than Protestant, 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 excuse me, Protestantism, the facts in question, though it's dogma and ritual symbolism. But neither in the past nor in the present has even Catholicism attained anything like the richness of the old pagan symbolism, which is why this symbolism persisted far into Christianity and then gradually went underground forming currents that from the early Middle Ages to modern times have never quite lost their vitality. To a large extent, they vanish from the surface, but changing their form, they come back again to compensate the one-sidedness of our conscious mind with this modern orientation. References Paracelsus. Our consciousness is so saturated with Christianity, so utterly molded by it, that the unconscious counterposition can discover no foothold there for the simple reason that it seems too much the antithesis of our ruling ideas. The more one-sidedly, rigidly, and absolutely the one position is held, the more aggressive, hostile, and incompatible will the other become. So that at first sight, there would see, seem to be little prospect of reconciling the two. 
But once the conscious mind admits at least the relative validity of all human opinion, then the opposition loses something of its irreconcilable character expression. In the meantime, the conflict casts round for appropriate expression in, for instance, the Oriental religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. The syncretism of theosophy goes a long way towards meeting this need, and that explains its numerous successes. Yeah, it's really interesting that he adds the footnote because that kind of takes up the issue that I was um, talking about last week where he was saying that essentially archetypes are created from external physical processes and uh, and then placed into the unconscious. Where, it's, mm. you know, I that's strange and that's stuck with me since I read it. Here, he almost includes another aspect that's equally as strange, but, you know, somewhat, um, there's at least an, an internal working going on here, whereas before it's, I've thought about why I find that so strange since we talked about it, and I still can't quite put my finger on it, but there's something about it that just doesn't, I can't either get my head around or it doesn't square with his later work or his later thoughts and i can't can't quite put my finger on it but this kind of answered some of my um, questions okay well i i think of um you know i think the addition of karma here is relevant um because it um it causes us to rethink where we're going right when it, when something karmic happens uh for example uh when i broke my leg for example boy not gonna be be that anymore and um you know i i, th I think of archetypes as as dry rivers through which when energy is put into it they it plays through so uh the mother archetype is an example um but sometimes karma acts such that 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 riverbed um, gets broken somehow. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, there's a you think of that river as going along, and then all of a sudden there's this huge earthquake, and the river now is at two levels by karma, and there, there takes a, some time for for readjustment of that. Um, I think I, I think I have an explanation as to why I find that the definition that he gave earlier in this chapter is so strange. He's talking about the notion of the sun hero myth, and he's saying that I've I've been asked many times how were archetypes created, and it seems to me that they're created from um, physical or external processes in in the external world. Um, but I was thinking that's so strange to me because, you know, you hear people often talk about things like the wise old man archetype or all of these other things that don't have anything to do with the planets moving around or trees or what have you. And that would also seem to me that there would be, you also hear Jungians say all the time, well, there very well might be a limited amount of, or I mean, there might be an unlimited amount of archetypes. Nobody can really say. Well, it seems to me if they're determined by physical processes or external processes, like there would be a limited number. It would be a very mm. definitely limited number. Um, because it would be relative, proportionally. Yeah, meanwhile, Mary Stein says there's only one archetype, and that's the self. And all the ar other archetypes uh, feed into it. You know, and I would add four words to clarify the self that I put in actually community form and identity policy for a municipality in Colorado um, in their comp plan. And it's all similar, comma, each unique. But so I'd, I'd buy the capital S, I'd buy the self as the only archetype and then put all similar, each unique as the tagline under. I mean, I, 
Sure, surely we think of, for example, an oak tree, and an oak tree is a tree and meets certain criteria to be a tree, but it does very different things. For example, if a, if a uh, telephone crew comes along and cuts off one of its limbs, uh, it will put its energy out in a different direction. Uh, mm -hmm. And and that you could call that that telephone crew as, as karma, right? And and so, mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't make it. Or the crash of 08, is, you know. Yeah, and that yeah, sure. Crash of 08, lose your life savings. You know. Then you put I now. put both. Yeah. Is that's really really interesting? Yeah, you put your energy in a different direction. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. That's really, really interesting. You say that about Mary Stein. I hadn't heard that, but I really, really appreciate that. And that, that strikes a very deep chord with me because, you know, I'm a, kind of as a personal endeavor, I'm always trying to find the similarities between what Young is saying and also what the Platonists are saying. I think that they're very, very similar in a lot of key respects. And one issue that, 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 that falls in place with is that, you know, in terms of platonic thought, they're all, and it starts with Parmenides, right? They're all talking about mm -hmm. this idea of the one. Everything mm -hmm. comes from the one. Right. Mm -hmm. Of course, that's how we talk about it in English. But in Greek, the words would be in autos, in being one, autos being self. So it's always the one self. But anytime it's translated into English, they always write one self itself or the one but never the self mm -hmm. it's interesting so you say that this is, fact, this that is very point they're always talking about the self in the exact same yeah. way that young is talking about the self mm -hmm. and that's right. very that's a but, very very interesting kind of harmony between those two things yeah let, let's give annabelle a shot here this, this well this directly relates to what um at least in this little bota deck book about the hermit um, and that actually relates to what I was saying about the hermit, you know, being all the way up on the peak. And then that means that he can go all the way down to the bottom. The hermit, I'm just going to read uh, this first paragraph of what it says, the Botodex says about the hermit. The hermit represents the one identity, all caps, or I am, all caps. He represents the consciousness of the man who has attained enlightenment in italics. And he stands upon the mountain peaks as a light bearer for those below him on the path. He is solitary alone. This symbolism points to the fact that in reality, the central self, capital S, of every one of us, which seems to us to be separate from every other self, that's not capitalized self, is that same one identity, all caps. Mm -hmm. because this key represents the one identity, all caps. It also symbolizes will, capital W, since the manifested universe came into being by an act of the capital P primal, capital W will of the caps, one identity. So this is kind of representing this oneness, the one that you're talking about, Nick, almost like a god very much I mean, in so. a sense it's saying it's what we call god created the universe that's what that is and it seems also to link with that murray stein idea it's very very much, just the same idea. it's very much the same idea and you know there's of course they're referring to the to the kabbalistic tree of life there and, and right and the hermit is always associated in the sense that they're describing him there with keter the top sphere on the tree, you know, the, the primal will to be, um, the urge to, to be and to know oneself and also to be at the height uh, of oneness or what have you. But it's also interesting too, there's some some uh, Hebrew letter symbolism there where the letter associated with that and then the bow to deck, you can see that his cap is in the form of the yod. Yeah. yeah. So the Hebrew letters... That's not the first letter in the alphabet, but Yod is always understood to be the seed of all the other letters. So if you look mm -hmm. at all the other letters, that same form of the letter uh -huh. 
either just extended to make that other letter. It's extended with some draping piece off of it, like in the case of a resh or in the case of uh. all that or um, Aleph or something like that. But essentially, it's just saying the same thing. Like the, the Yod is the central letter of the entire alphabet. Mm. And all of the other letters are just masks of that same letter. Well, mm. that's beautiful because then the inner light of the hermit Yod is the seed of everything else. I mean, that's that light within each of us is then that yod, that yod, the seed of everything else. Right. Yes. That one sounds side. like Yahweh, too. It sounds mm -hmm. like. Yeah, it, it is Yod Hey, Thou Hey. Mm -hmm. I want to make a comment about the footnote, which I find to be a really good example of what Jung's asking us to do. Um, to you know, be your own parent, basically. The child becomes a parent of the adult. Right. But when he um when he says um he's talking about being criticized, he doesn't go here and explain himself. Note how it ended how it ends. But I have always wondered what sort of idea my critics would have used to characterize the empirical material, i.e., his in question. His no apology. He is, that's his own, he is his own person. So there's no explaining, there's no petitioning, there's no, I mean, basically no explaining to do Lucy. I mean, kind of thing there. I mean, he just says it and the, you know, empirical material in question, that's his work being a scientific thing. So I laugh that, I mean, that's taken a, that's taken a 30 odd six right at the target from about 10 feet. I mean, just pull the trigger. He, yeah, but I mean, he, I just love that. Many volumes explaining himself. Well, right. But then when he comes in his footnote, all he says is the material, empirical material in question. And so when he comes down to it, he can be concise right there. Yeah. I, I often feel like it's, we've talked about this before, but it's, I guess it takes that much, uh, that many pages to unpack the complex ideas. You're breaking up a little. Uh, yeah. I, I was just saying, I know that we've touched on this before, and I, I guess it's understandable that that many pages and that many volumes are required to unpack such complex ideas. But in many cases, I often feel like they are just pages and pages and pages of Jung just qualifying his ideas. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's very painful. Um, that's why I like Lawrence uh, Jaffe's book. It's funny because I find it, I find it like a big hot tub, hot spring of words. <laughs> so, I love it. Well, yeah, sure. So do I in the sense that I've been reading it for, I don't know, 33 years or something like that. But I also like to be able to look at Jaffe and see his perspective because he's taken a very small book and really uh, encapsulated, uh, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of Jungian thought, right, right down to the, to the kernel. Right? You know, and I think that's, that's a good observation because I think Jung put out the oceans of this and you get Jaffe, you get um, Eric Neumann, you get uh, Mary Louise von Franz, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then they, the protégés, the best students who then became colleagues, simplified it to be even really, really interesting. Not just you have to dial in and low third gear to kind of make your way up this hill through all of Jung's work. Because um, it is dense. I mean, I, I'll, I, I'll give it that. Yeah, I, um, I, I like I like what he says uh, in, I don't know, chapter four here. It's one sentence, one sentence where he sum, summarizes everything. He says, the purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make it accessible to us that healing power, which resides in our unconscious. Mm -hmm. So the point is, that we do have a healing power mm -hmm. of the psyche in our unconscious. And by studying Jung, we're getting access to that. 
Mm-hmm. And there's a trial, a rite of passage to navigate right. that much density continually for long, long periods of time. It's like a marathon runner of reading. I mean, yeah. <laughs> even if it's taken okay. a paragraph speaking, at a time. Speaking of marathons, let's let's get on here with, with 119. Uh, yeah. Um, Annabelle, would you uh, read 119, please? Yep. The work involved in analytical treatment gives rise to experiences of an archetypal nature which require to be expressed and shaped. Obviously, this is not the only occasion for experiences of such a kind. Often they occur quite spontaneously and by no means only in the case of quote, psychological minded quote, close quote people. I have heard the most curious dreams and visions from the lips of people whose mental sanity not even the professional psychologist could doubt. The experience of the archetype is frequently guarded as the closest personal secret because it is felt to strike into the very core of one's being. It is like a primordial experience of the non-ego of an interior opponent who throws down a challenge to the understanding. Naturally enough, we then look round for helpful parallels. And it happens all too easily that the original occurrence is interpreted in terms of derivative ideas. A typical instance of this kind is the Trinity vision of brother Nicholas of Philly. Of flu. Of flu, flu. Or again, St. Ignatius. Uh, brother, brother Klaus. Brother Klaus. Um, or again, St. Ignatius's vision of the snake with multiple eyes, which he interpreted first as a divine apparition and then as a visitation from the devil. Through these paraphrastic interpretations, the authentic experience is replaced by images and words borrowed from a foreign source and by views, ideas, and forms that have not grown on our soil and have no ties with our hearts, but only with our heads. Indeed, not even our thought can clearly grasp them because it never invented them. It is a case of stolen goods that bring no prosperity. Such substitutes make men shadowy and unreal. They put empty words in the place of living realities and slip out of the painful tension of opposites into a one, two-dimensional, phantasmal world where everything vital and creative withers and dies. <laughs> mm-hmm. We got this is this is becoming a theatrical play. I like that because he yeah. he's getting in there. Well, I I don't entirely agree with him though, because um, I have had visionary experiences that involve both the European mind and the Japanese mind, and uh, for example, on the occasion that. Um, my my daughter told me you're going to I'm sorry to say this Deb but you're going to hell or I think you're going to hell and on the way home Mephistopheles plumped down in the seat next to me in the car okay now maybe he was there for only five or ten seconds but because I had been studying Jung for maybe maybe over a decade by then I said, oh, okay, so this is how um, born again preachers scare people into their faith. Uh, because if you, you know, there, there's truth to the idea that um, if you speak of the devil, he appears, right? There is truth to that. And, and I can vouch for it from my personal experience. And so, but I'm an American. I'm not. I'm not a European, at least not for you know 13 generations, I guess, um, in in terms of my paternal line. And 
you know, still I'm having, you know, because I read Faustus in college, I have, you know, I had an image of him when I studied the play, I imagined what he would look like. And so it was that image that sat down next to me, right? And so I, I, it was obvious, I said, well, I'm gonna cut the Faustian bargain. I mean, th this happened in like five, 10 seconds, but I said to myself, I'm gonna fa cut the Faustian bargain. And I made the bargain that um, you can have my eternal soul on my death provided none of my daughters think that of me for the rest of my life. Okay, and he disappeared and he never came back. Okay, and so boom, you know, in, in five, 10 seconds, I made him poof away. But, you know, somebody else driving at 65 miles an hour and that happens to them, they could easily drive off the road or, you know, have, have a critical accident in some way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it goes to show too, the thoughts become things and the, the liminal boundaries, whether you understand dream form, you were schooled in Jung, so, you know, you, you are now going to have a conversation with this person you hadn't had a conversation with. They, they're there. You know, like a businessman, you went, okay, you're at the table, let's talk. I mean, you, you engaged, which to me is beautifully interesting because you engaged. <laughs> you know, you're like, oh, all right. You know, and it goes back to, I mean, the movie even Gladiator or the whole thing, you know, death smiles at us all, but all you can do is smile back. I mean, you don't get afraid. That's the worst. Panic is the worst thing for a situation. So you engage yeah, them. And, and who knows how long it would have lasted if I hadn't had that in, instinctual response right. to it. You know, because the other one, the, the Japanese one, which came out as my novel, lasted eight months. It was a literal possession by my anima. And it was only, you know, years later that I figured that out. Uh, and, uh, you know, but that, okay, I, I had lived in Japan. So, I, you know, some of it had rubbed off on me. Uh, I think it would also be slightly different if it were like a um, something to do with mythology. Uh, well, why mythology, Nick? I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't... Mythology is always connected to religion, and it would be interesting. I mean, you know, it's not yeah, like... But, but you know, but or these like things, religion. you know, not everything has to do with the Greeks. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. Okay. Do you because, think mythology has to do with the Greeks? Well, I mean, you know... Because it doesn't. Every culture has a mythology. Uh, well, okay, but... Um, But the point is, um, you know, why, why, why do I have to think about mythology in order to think about this, these issues? You know, why, do, why do I have, have to have a parallel? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just questioning you so that you can think about these issues for the future, but you know, why do why does there have to be a parallel in some mythology? Um, in there, order, it doesn't. And I just want to make my make my meaning clear here because I, okay. I have, have been um, spoken dimly. Um, I was just saying that in the case of writing your novel, you know, it's a, it's a young, uh, I, I believe, if I'm mistaken, correct me, a young Japanese woman. Yes. Which you were having visitations from. Um, but yes. I was just saying it would it would be um, I think in the case here he's saying that you know whatever the whatever the archetypes might be let me let me source the line here indeed not even our thought can clearly grasp them because it was never because it never invented them it is a case of stolen goods that bring no prosperity so right you know I could go try to relate to some um, Japanese deities from the Shinto religion or something and try to say, you know, I really found a home in that belief system, but it might not be as easy for me to relate to that as somebody of European descent. And 
you know, mm. whatever mythology, whether it be early, um, maybe some kind of Norse mythology or Greek mythology or the obvious Christian kind of mythology and symbol set would probably appeal to me more so. But I don't, I, I was just saying, I, I think that what he's saying here is that in your case, it's a different situation because it's just somebody that you had personal experience with, you had time in Japan. So it was personally relevant to you. It was not like you were experiencing some mythological character from Japan. But well, I, would, I mean, assuredly, I was following an archetypal pattern, okay? Because I, I was intentionally following uh, an archetypal pattern presented by Clarissa Pincola Estes in Women Who Run With the Wolves. And in that pattern, there is... There, there is a fa fairy tale that um, applies to that. It's a sort of a central Russian fairy tale. Yeah. Um, and, and so... Uh, it's the one about, uh, is it Vasilisa? Yeah, it's Vasilisa the Wise. And so, right. you know, Estes has put down you know, the nine steps that women go through to develop their intuition. Okay. Um, that's what she says. I think she's actually just describing the process of women's individuation, because in fact, the novel ends up being the individuation of the, of the heroine. Um, I also just want to say, of course, I'm not saying that you or anyone needs to necessarily be um, familiar with mythology. And if I am, take it with a grain of salt. I mean, what do I know? Uh, but also, I think it's interesting to note that, you know, it's, I, I'm personally not dreaming of Japanese or, or, or Buddhist or what have you characters. No, of course Something not. Probably of kind of the European psyche that might pop up in my psyche. Yeah, you know, it's somebody else. What comes to me, Skip, every time you mention the Mephistopheles um, recount, it it's the shortest, not one act play. It's a one scene play of answer to Job, and you're like, I'm going to nip this in the butt. I mean, so it, it comes and goes, but it's the whole story in a way of the of of Job. But in just the conversation with your daughter, you get in the car. And then you speak me. And then sorry, it's we done. didn't hear any but of that, you, Jordan. Yeah, Jordan. you broke up, Jordan. You broke well, up. It, Say that. Again. It, it seems to me that's the shortest one scene, not one act play of the story of Answer to Job, where you have the conversation with your daughter, you get in the car, Mephistopheles appears, you're a businessman, you make a deal, done next and by making the deal you stop all of job's suffering that would be coming your way if you would have turned away or like you so aptly said this is how fundamentalist preachers get people yeah, because then they get them stuck in that quicksand and you went no i'm not going there here's what's been we're going to make a deal and boom and you didn't ask a question you you posed a proposal and, yeah, but it was it, it was an in, instinctual thing. I didn't even say I'm going to make the Faustian bar bargain. No, but what I'm saying is naturally that was your mode of being, and you 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 saw the suffering down the road and went uh. -uh. Um, I I want to um I want to say something about this uh, okay. based on the experience that I had on November 22nd this year, where. I was driving down the road and, and having had this experience, I relate to what you're saying, Skip, in a different way because mm -hmm. of my actual experience. And I had someone else in the car who witnessed exactly what I was witnessing. The phone would ring as we answered it, which was, she was hearing, you know, it's a phone in a car, so it's coming through the radio. Yeah. Which in, in itself is, you know, some kind of mind boggling, you know, <laughs> mythological folk, something, right? It's his voice, right. Right? Deus ex machina. 
<laughs> so the voice is saying your father died. And what's straight ahead of us? A crossroads. It was a fork in the road. Every single time that there was a significant, not even a significant call. I mean, because every call was significant. It was a funeral director. It was a hospice nurse. It was, right? And each moment that those calls happened, so that my my friend, the passenger next to me in the car, we were stunned you know once they it happened like the fourth time it was just mm -hmm. like wow now and then i you know with my background both family and just personal interests in folk traditions which we can call slash mythology and you meet the devil at the crossroads or you meet death at the crossroads or you meet mm -hmm. whatever you meet at the crossroads it is the crossroads it's the story of robert johnson you know that sure. at one point that musician was at a crossroads and that was it he never could turn back and he was you know he became robert johnson i mean so i couldn't turn back because the first crossroads and this is crossroads this is the New Jersey Turnpike heading to Philadelphia. This is not some imaginary realm. You know, this isn't saying that what Skip had as a passenger or whatever you call a companion in the car. These are not imaginary realms. This is mm -hmm. the real world. No, oh, they're quite real. Yeah. And then Jung says as much that the un the inner world is is just as real as the outer world. Exactly. I mean, and it, it, it's and honestly. There, it's one's the fuel and one's the car, and they can switch around. Yeah, they switch around. I mean, they they frankly, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers, except you know, whichever one is behind you is the one more powerful. Mm. Yeah, or in front of you. I mean, it just doesn't direction doesn't matter. Okay, we got five so more. We five more. Read the last here. paragraph and make that so goal. Let's, let's make let Nick read the last paragraph since he's gonna. Turn into a pumpkin at 10. <laughs> <Great. laughs> I see the orange coming under the ear. <laughs> All right. The wordless occurrences, which are called forth by regression to the pre infantile period, need no substitutes. They demand to be individually shaped in and by each man's life and work. They are images sprung from a life, the joys and sorrows of our ancestors. And to life they seek to return, not in experience only, but also in deed. Because of their opposition to the conscious mind, they can be translated straight into our world. Hence, a way must be found that can mediate between conscious and unconscious reality. And before we go away from this, I just want to say, let's quickly, I'm going to read this last line and then let's refer back to the end of 116, okay? Because okay. of their opposition to the conscious mind, they cannot be translated into our world. Hence, a way must be found that can mediate between conscious and unconscious reality. Okay? And yep. there's another line. The worst feature of all is that there appears to be no way out of this condition. Tertium non deterris has logic. There is no middle way. What the hell? No, no, no. He's saying there's no middle way of um, logic saying that um, but that it you need to find a way to mediate between the two. So there's, he, I think he's saying you need to find a way so they can dance together instead of here. He's taking a shot at capital R reason because tertium non detour says logic. That's Jung saying, not me. That's what logic says. There is no middle way is what I see rather than him saying yeah, those then, statements. Then he says, but you need to find a middle way. Well, and you, you need to find the transcendent function, and how does that work? You know, that's, that's no, but uh, he says you can f found hence a way, a way, not a middle way, must be found that can mediate and or i.e. dance with between conscious and unconscious, rather than a middle way. I don't see that as a as an averaging or. Right. 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 He's not wanting you to ride the fence. He's wanting you to have a foot on both sides. I feel well, right. as a mediator, but a between person, a, a person between two parties. No, but That's when you I'm mediate saying. for yourself, you have a foot on both sides. Yeah. When you are a mediator, you, you are that in between. But when you med mediate for yourself, you have a foot on both sides. 
And I right, think that's right. what he's saying is the right foot, left foot, unconscious, conscious through life moving forward, self-mediation is one person who has a connection in the middle, but you mediate them both. Yeah, that's is what why I, I feel is, the distinction. Is. This is why art is so important. I mean, this is the uh, the wisdom of, of Colleen Kibert because if if she can show you how to how to hear your unconscious which she does that she does she has very simple ways of making you hear your unconscious and once you do that um it's hard to go back actually i would think um and and our problem with our education system is we've we've down graded art so badly um, that it's going to be hard to get it back, but we have to because mm -hmm. that because that's what gives us the strongest culture and the strongest population, uh, the most I, most I creative. Agree. Yeah. I, yeah, most creative thing, and I agree because I think the primary arguments against art in the schools, one, they say, oh, that's just giving them some daydream time off lazy monkey business the other is oh they can't make a living with that when as you've yeah. mentioned before that's not the point the point is to activate the psyche and then what happens there is by navigating that function if you're an attorney a doctor uh, architect artist i mean no matter what business you are in you then have a more robust and balanced way of navigating your life and your yeah. business Absolutely true. And, you know, I was experiencing this indirectly without knowing why it was happening. But when I was painting for five years, if I was painting, my life worked better. Okay. My life just was working better when I was painting. If I stopped for a period of time, it started to go on the rocks for some reason. And I started to see the correlation between the two. And, and uh, you know, that's the bizarre thing. That's what we're going to try to teach next summer to show people. Um, but people's lives do work better with art. Um, and, you know, way, you know, it's irris irrespective of whether you make your living at, at our, you know, um, you know, Jordan Peterson did a short video recently that Kushfu showed me where he's saying, oh, well, you know, you're never going to be this big artist that can do a cathedral or, you know, a Michelangelo or something like that. So you might as well get up, give up, basically saying you might as well give up and, and, uh, Get, go get a job in the logos, right? Mm -hmm. And and the point isn't that. The point isn't whether you can sell anything. The point is activating your unconscious so that something works. So, I mean, it's as simple as I've said so many times, making an omelet in the morning for somebody, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that's a creative act. And it connects me up with my conscious, unconscious every time I do it. Um, and I make it the same way every time, <laughs> but it's, it always comes out different. It doesn't look the same, it doesn't taste the same, but I use the same ingredients exactly. And, uh, but the process of making it, of constructing it, pulling the pieces together, just a few simple pieces and then producing this omelet on my wife's plate opens up my unconscious on those. Mm -hmm. It's that, and, like it was, I think I mentioned on Sunday, instead of discipline of the ritual, it's discipline. Yeah, yeah, it is that, yeah. Um, so Miles says, check out Jordan and Skip Sunday session. I was so impacted that I created a timeline with par paraphrased selected statements. 
Jung on how to live and the origin of do the next right thing. Thank you, Miles, uh, for that uh, advertisement. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it, it tells me, Jordan, that I, I may start going and pulling uh, some of these letters because they, they, they are poignant. Many of the letters that uh, were, accept, were uh, put in these two volumes, there, there are two volumes about that thick. And, you know, uh, and I, I think I think that's a good idea because I think we've um, I mean, we haven't pounded out as for pound, but I think we got far enough where we were always having to turn it back to how does this apply to a Jungian perspective? And if right. we get the letters, I think we'll we'll have purer water in the in the pool to play yeah, with. I mean, I, I still have the pound here, but I, you know, in my heart of hearts, I know that I'm never going to get back to reading and appreciating uh, what he meant. And besides, I have a surprise for you, which you'll have on the uh, 26th Boxing Day. Nice. You're, uh, <laughs> I, I still don't know the day that yours is hitting yours, but um, it should be soon. Yeah, but it's, um, anyway. Um, oh. So, you know, we made uh, it. We made it through the whole yeah, chapter. So we're going next week uh, to the synthetic or the constructive method. Okay, I have no idea what he means by that, but chapter six of this book, starting on synthetic page Synthetic method. That's, I think that's exactly what later came to be known as the transcendent function or the that that whole idea, because it's the synthesis between the Okay, well, conscious and all that jazz. That that title, this is a chapter, kind of reminds me of the book Einstein's. Um, is it um, Einstein, Einstein's Mind and Van Gogh's Sky? I think it's the book. And the title's skipping me, but they talk a lot about reductionism. It's, the title was so much better than the book, but anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyway, well, yeah. So Thanks, we, everybody. Have, we have done it for tonight. And uh, thank you, Nick, for hanging in there with us. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm on yeah. Christmas break. So uh, the world so is Christmas, my here. Oh. Christmas break. And, I'm and, not just uh, playing hooky. Savannah yeah, is I'm not, not just playing hooky. Savannah hooky. is not, not there tapping her foot. Yeah. No. <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, I'm not suggesting that she does tap her foot, but <laughs> I, but I, I know what it means when you have to leave at a time certain. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I, I know. I've been given carte blanche. Ah, only <laughs> for only for vacations or what? <laughs> I guess I don't know. If she might crack the whip. Otherwise, yeah, okay. that I should probably go. So I'll see you all next week. Okay, peace. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, don't let him drag, don't let him drag, the, drag each other rabbit hole. For, thank you for being here, Marilyn. I really thank appreciate your presence. Yeah. Good night, everyone. A couple of emergency phone calls during um, while we were on. One of my friends lost power. Oh, my God. And um, they wanted to come over and spend the night. So then I had to check with my daughter, is that okay with you? And then I, it, it was okay. And then I, then they called back to say, well, their power came on. Oh. <laughs> I mean, a little bit of rain, it's like the end of the world. You don't know what right. to do. Yeah. A little bit of rain. I mean, I used to live on the East Coast and we, I lived in upstate New York and we get um, snowstorms, blizzards. <laughs> Yeah. You know, where, black, where did you where in upstate new york well it was uh poughkeepsie my husband was with ibm uh -huh. so we were in poughkeepsie but i remember my daughter went to school um in a little town called delhi i don't know mm -hmm. if it, um and they they didn't even plow the roads because they would keep snowing so you mm -hmm. would have to drive in the in the trench marks of the car in front of you. Mm -hmm. So here, when you you get a, you get rain and then the power goes out, they don't know what to do with it. It's the most bizarre thing. So I had to keep getting the phone to see what was happening. And I apologized for that. 
Oh, no worries. No worries. Uh, life goes I think well. it's funny in places people where, yeah. I mean, one, family comes first, friends, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah. two, yeah. I mean, people get a quarter inch of snow. They've never seen snow. And the world's, I mean, it, it's like, wow, stop being chicken little. The sky yes. is not falling. <laughs> they're so they get so terrified but here the power goes out it's it's bizarre mm -hmm. they have to yeah. they have to get generators for their homes i mean it's really bizarre yeah it's wild because the power goes out in taos like regularly and so i remember two weeks after i was here i talked to someone and they said oh that's how you know you're in taos it's like because <laughs> <laughs> just okay <laughs> well the same is, is true in annapolis where we have a very forested city because the, mm. the forests are pretty impressive in Maryland. And, uh, you know, if we have a storm of any kind, we'll, we'll have trees and branches down and they take, take out our power. In fact, we lost power tonight for a period of time. Uh, so. Sorry. I don't remember it happening when I was a kid, you know, um, but then I lived on the desert. I lived in Kodiak. So the Navy provided our power with generators. <laughs> I don't know what the yeah. heck they did. <laughs> so I remember in Denver that they would they would cite you if you didn't continually you get a ticket on your front doorstep if you didn't continually keep your branches 48 inches from the power lines. I mean they they, they wanted it through. And I, I remember mentioning that in Philly once and someone looked at me like I had two heads. So like, that's, that's no. And I'm like, okay, we got a different sensibility going on here. Yeah. You're going to okay. buy a problem. So, so great Jordan, to see you guys. I have one question for you. Is your bear hibernating? Is my bear hibernating? Yes. We used to see the bear off your back deck. Oh, oh, that's up at the cabin. I haven't been there in about in about two months now. Um, I closed the cabin down second week in October because in February it'll be 40 below it, for several days, which to me is that's not my constitution. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, um, that that bear I found out was named Cinnamon, that beautiful bear we saw that day. Yes. Well, a lot of the tourists, I mean, their big signs don't feed the bears. You know, a fed bear is a dead bear because what they get, they start getting aggressive. And he got obnoxious and they took him out. Oh. Yeah. So yeah. I, I do appreciate you asking, though, because he, oh, he, he was, was really. Gorgeous. Yeah. And he was near and dear to me. I, there were times when I'd sit out, we just stare at each other. You know, if he started coming forward, I'd go inside. I mean, I, I didn't want to push the envelope, but. He was a great bear, but when he left, I'm five miles up from the town, but all the bears one weekend disappeared. And it's like there was a bear internet and there was a whole group of people who were feeding them in one of the RV parks. And one guy got all angry because they, they got into his car, but they saw people doing this, lifting the handles. So the bears would do this and there would be the, the nail scrapes up the car because there'd be a sandwich in there. And one of the reporters asked the guy, he's like, well, did you have food in the car? He goes, well, yeah, I had my lunch. It's like, you're a, and the reporter said, you're a bonehead. You're going to make the bears be killed. And several days later, I got the news that um, he, he had been fed too much. And so he just got obnoxious. And um, so he started coming, you know, up to people, but in a day. So thanks for asking, because I, I kind of had my own little ceremony on the deck for him because he was he was gorgeous it's a great attitude i mean he, he wasn't aggressive at all to me he just hang out and, and i was glad to be there in nature with him but then it was one weekend all the bears disappeared from where we are up up high because i think the bear internet just started saying oh there's free, free buffet yeah. you know so, skip i don't know if you know this so this would be interesting jordan you know what colleen's spirit animal is uh, uh yeah a, a polar, bear. Uh, polar bear yeah polar bear bear and sure. she's made all kinds of work uh, with gorgeous white polar bear it's just beautiful you know what i ought to do is go to one of the fetish shops here and i have this one that i carry with me for my table mm -hmm. oh 
so much. And I love this stone because it looks like it's emerging and coming together at the same time. I don't know if it's correct, but a friend of mine gave me this for my birthday about 10 years ago. But I wonder if I can find a white one that's like a polar bear for Colleen. That's good. So I'm going to have to leave. Yeah. But it's. So are we all. Yes. Good yep. to see everybody. You too. I'll be back um, next week. Bye bye. Have a good night. Marilyn, take care. Bye -bye. You too. Take care, everybody.